to help him with his Subaru. Nick was on the Subaru, and so wanted to do some kind of a, I don't know, replacing the brake drum or something. And it was more than Nick was going to tackle by himself, so Leon came down. I guess Leon was out on the front porch looking at some uh, videos, and Nick was heard something, went out there, and he was collapsed. And uh, so Nick was... Did CPR on him, called the called the uh, ambulance and everything, but uh, Leon didn't make it. So Nicholas has got a really tough time, and of course Leon's uh, widow now is has got a real tough time too. Because you know, like Tammy texted me, I was telling, talking to her a little bit about it today, and she said she felt really bad for Don because. Leon left today, he thought he was going to get to see him. You know, so kind of tough. He's, he's not going to get to do that. So uh, let's pray for Donna. Oh, hey, there I am. Donna Munoz and uh, Nicholas, too, uh, that family, as they go through these hard times of, of grieving. What else do we have going on? Pretty quiet. Yeah. How about that? Um, I don't think of anything right off. Uh, there's several concerns I have here in the church as far as our work. Uh, do you want to continue to pray for our uh, Wednesday nights and vacation Bible school that's going to come up here in a little while? Our camping program. Uh, we'll have. Uh, uh, some things to do around Easter and Palm Sunday that I want to go real well. So uh, a lot of those things that are ahead of us, we need to be praying about our programs and the things that we're doing that way. And of course, we've been able to have, enjoy uh, some some influx of people in the last little bit as far as people who've, who've either joined us or uh, have... Uh, been visiting that type of thing, so we want to make sure that we're able to to uh, retain those people and their interest and their activity amongst us. That's just such a important feature to us, and we yearn for that. We don't want we don't want people to turn out to be uh, roadside soil or rocky soil. We want them to be that good soil, of course, and. Uh, even if they're weedy, so we can deal with that. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, those are concerns I have. All right, uh, not hearing any others, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do pray tonight, uh, pressing to me is, is uh, the, the friends and the family of, uh, of Leon Munoz, I just pray for them and Thank you so much, Father, for the days that we knew him and uh, that Nicholas has been so close to him. And I uh, thank you for his life, that his life mattered and that he, he gave himself to you and to working hard under that uh, understanding that he was living for you. And I pray, Father, that you would bless his family with those that are near to remember him. I pray that you'll be with his family. Uh, his wife, Donna, bless her and keep her as she travels and as she goes through these hard days of making arrangements and uh, getting things uh, to where they need to be. Father, we pray for our little church as we continue to go forward. We pray that you would uh, bless us. Thank you for the strength that you give us, for the people that are here that uh, have been here all along and for those that are here and haven't been but just a little while. We pray, Father, that you will just strengthen all in each of us, keep us uh, eager to help one another, and uh, help us to, to find ways to do that with uh, a zeal and a, a great love that makes uh, those around us know that you are here, that this is your home, and that you, you supply us the power and the energy and the, the will, because uh, we know personally 
uh, of ourselves that we couldn't do it without you and there is nothing in us that would have uh, behaved or worked that way but with you here in us we know that we can and we we trust that we will find these things as we go forward in you please bless all those programs and those things that we have out front uh, please help us to be ready for them and uh, Help us to be ready for those to co that come to us. Help us to know them, love them, encourage them, however and wherever we can. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Tonight, as we start again on our study of John, um, it is, of course, Wednesday night, March 23rd. We're studying in the, the uh, shouldn't be the 12th chapter, it should be the 13th chapter verse 12 that's where i messed up it's 13 12 and 14 that's incorrect up there uh so 13 12 is where we're going to start tonight so when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again he said to them do you know what i've done to you now this may overlap a little bit from what we had last week but it won't be much uh so that's his question to them uh, once he's washed their feet and uh, showed them that he was willing to sit down on the floor in front of them, lift up their feet, wash them, dry them off, and uh, make them comfortable in, insofar as the way their uh, foot uh, hygiene was that evening. When he did all that, he sits down at, at the table and says, do you know what I've done to you? He gets them to thinking. Uh, he says, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who, sent, who is sent greater than the one who sent him, if you know these things, you're blessed if you do them. Uh, how are we supposed to think then? Once we've seen Jesus do this, do, we, do you think that if you were there that night that Jesus would have washed your feet? Yes. I think he would have. I think that in washing the disciples, the apostles' feet, he is in effect washing all of our feet. So take it that way. Uh, what are we supposed to think then? <clears throat> yes, that we're not any greater than he is, so? Okay. So if my brother's feet need washing, you're supposed to do it. Yeah, you are supposed to do it. Do you do it? That's the question. Um, one of my favorite people that I've run across in my ministry, she's now gone, so she doesn't care if I talk about her. Uh, her name was Betty, and uh, we have, I still know this fellow, uh, but I don't think he'll, he'll know too much about what I'm saying. Maybe he will, uh, but he's, he was a person that needed his feet washed, and he needed his feet cared for because he was in a condition he couldn't really reach him. And Betty, she's not a doctor. She doesn't work in a doctor's office. She's just a person that knows his needs, and she took care of him. That's Betty. Right. I think that that's what it is. It is. It's taking care of one another's needs. It's not necessarily, in other words, you probably don't need me to wash your feet. Um, if you do, you know, say the word. I'm not afraid of your feet. Uh, so, but, but Jesus does more, I think, here than just say something about washing feet. Uh, what size is this ask that he is doing here? And how far do we push it? He says, uh, 
I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. What else does Jesus do? For us, for others. What's the biggest thing Jesus ever did for you? Died on the cross for us, didn't he? Yeah. And what does he say is the, the extreme measure of love? What is the greatest measure of love there is? If we lay, lay down our lives for our friends, then that's the greatest love we can have. That's love. That's what Jesus did. That's the example he calls us to. And I really think it's behind the uh, large number of American uh, servicemen that uh, have given their lives in combat and many uh, other situations as well. Uh, firemen have given themselves. Uh, people just on the roadside in certain conditions have, have given themselves up just to save a, a, a stranger or a neighbor. And uh, I think it's because it's in us. It's, it's part of our understanding of what love is, and we really do get it. And we really do want to show ourselves as the followers of Jesus Christ. Uh, so I think we push it. This question at the bottom of this slide says, how far do we push it? We push it all the way. We push it all the way to being willing to give ourselves up for the sake of another. Uh, what is the motive for this behavior again? Why do, you, why do you do that? Why did Jesus do it? Did it for love for us, isn't it? What is the inspiration for this behavior? If this is something that happens for you someday and you stand in the gap and you give yourself, uh, what would be your inspiration for it? Love for others. Love for others and perhaps Jesus himself because he loved this way and you just said, man, that's the way I got to live. He gave the second commandment several times that you love one another as I have loved you. Right. Exactly, and that really, that really completes that equation for us very nicely, uh, that uh, we, in fact, should love as he loved. Uh, with whom do we hope to share when, he, when we humble ourselves to this behavior? Jesus. With Jesus, that's right, absolutely. That's what Paul says in the book of Philippians. He talks about how he wants to share in the sufferings of Christ. Uh, and, and in that suffering to have fellowship with him. Uh, Jesus continues his speech. He says, I do not speak of all of you. When he's speaking to these men, he says, I don't speak of all of you. I know the ones I've chosen, but it is that the scripture may, may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. What is Jesus talking about now when he says this? Okay, all right, he's talking about Judas. From now on, he says, I am telling you before it comes to pass, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. What do you call a person who can accurately tell the future and, and they draw you closer to God? What would you say that person is? A prophet. A prophet, okay. And Jesus has this messianic title, and what are the three titles within the messianic title? Absolutely. There you go. Prophet, priest, and king. Truly, truly, he says, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. What do you make of this promise and how might that work out today? Truly, truly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. I'll give you an example. Jesus, in the moments before uh, his triumphal entry, he tells his uh, disciples, two of his disciples, to go get this donkey. And uh, they go down and, and they are asked questions and they, they said, well, our master has need of it. And the guy said, that owned the donkey, just go ahead and use it, you know. So 
who did that guy really say yes to? Jesus. He said yes to Jesus, didn't he? So think about that. He who, who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. When he maketh a promise, how might that work out today? Yeah. Okay. What does God send people today other than Jesus himself? Yeah, I think he does. And uh, I, I think it's up to us to, to recognize it when he does and to, uh, to be receptive of those people. Uh, I, think, I think that it almost feeds right into this question about that Jesus raises for us in Matthew, the 25th chapter, when he talks about, well, inasmuch as you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to me. So that when you and I encounter somebody that's needy, it nearly comes to us as a person, a messenger from God, as it were that we need to take care of them and help them. And uh, I just want to get your brain working along that line. And you don't have to agree with me 100%, but think about what I'm saying and uh, see how you come out on that. See what a difference it will make for you in your life when you begin to meet the person uh, that the opportunities that, that come to you, uh, how does that work out? Uh, when Jesus had said this, he became troubled in spirit and testified and said, Truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. It's kind of almost like Jesus has almost resisted saying anything like this, and suddenly it's time to tell it. And so he simply blurts it out. Uh, truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. Uh, and, and this comes as a shock, not just to... You know, it's, it's not, I don't know, shocking to Jesus. I think it's, it's terribly, terribly hurtful. Or, uh, he, he struggles with it. It's traumatic for him that one of his own disciples will betray him. I think it hurts him a lot. But I think it also becomes quite a, uh, quite a challenge and a fearful thing for the rest of his disciples. Uh, and I put it this way, the matter which has been lurking emerges at last. The disciples, it says, began looking at one another at a loss to know of which one he was speaking. So they, they don't even know which disciple is going to betray him. They're not aware of who that is. And if you look in the other accounts of this same uh, event, then what is it that, do you remember what the disciples began to say? Who is it? It is I. Is it I, Lord? Is it I? They were also very concerned that it, you know, they, they were so distrustful in a certain sense of their own selves. They were so desperately fearful that they might let Jesus down some way that they were, they were asking, you know, well, is it me? So they were turned inwardly by this and uh, not really able to figure it out very well at all. Uh, in John, you get a little bit more work on it, I think. Uh, although they don't ask that question in John, you see something else going on. Uh, why do you think it was impossible for any of the apostles to know which one it was? Don't seem to be able to tell. Why didn't they know? Why didn't they automatically say, Ah, Judas Iscariot, we knew it. <laughs> they hadn't thought the concept was possible. I think that's part of it. They didn't think it was possible. They hadn't thought of it as a possibility. Like surely not one of them would do that, right? Right. That's like Peter later. He just says it up and down. He was yeah. one of the nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, he probably had that in the back of his mind. Possibility, you know. And I was often wondering how in the world Judas sat there in that room with all those 12 apostles, apostles and Jesus himself and acted like he didn't know. He yeah. Didn't Must have been a poker player. 
Well, you know, Judas Iscariot, as I understand it, he was some of his uh, past had been in, in uh, kind of a, a zealot type of an arrangement where he was uh, something of a, of a rebellious type. Uh, but some of the other ones were also. So it's, it's not, that's, that doesn't necessarily cut it. But anyway, uh, I think you've got a point. That is, how did, how did he ma mind his manners and not kind of pop up and say, well, I've got to get out of here, see you, you know. Uh, instead, he never really leaves until Jesus prompts him. Uh, there was reclining on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Now, who is this disciple? We, norm, we, we say this, yeah, John is the guy. John is the disciple uh, whom Jesus loved in the book of John. John refuses to identify himself, so he just says the disciple whom Jesus loved. Uh, so, so Simon Peter gestured to him, uh, gestures to John, and said to him, Tell us who it is of whom he is speaking. So he makes some kind of motion and says, Tell us who it is of whom he is speaking. Describe a gesture that Peter may have used. I'm just kind of curious. What, is, how, what kind of a motion did he make? He just kind of nod his head. Hey, take you know, <laughs> tell, us, tell us who that guy is. <laughs> Find out. <laughs> So I don't know. I mean, what kind of a gesture was there? I think this is part of, part of our key to making ourselves really uh, sort of current with what John the Apostle is telling us here. If we can get our imagination working in, along with his words, much like we do when we're reading a novel or something, our imagination just goes lickety split. Well, it should when you're reading the novel, or when you're reading John too, you should be thinking about what it was like he, leaning back thus on Jesus' bosom, says to him, Lord, who is it? So nobody could tell. It's kind of finally, hey, give it up. We want to know. Jesus answers, that is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. So uh, Jesus says, I'm going to show you. Uh, so when he had dipped the morsel, he takes and gives it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscari the son of Simon. Iscariot. So uh, he gives it to Judas. After the morsel, Satan entered into him. Therefore, Jesus says to him, what you do, do quickly. I don't, I'm not quite sure what this means. Satan then entered into him. Was this all on hold? Because really, he had made some arrangements already uh, Iscariot had. Uh, what was this? Was the final, the, you know, final step is, well, finally Jesus knows what I'm doing and I've wanted to do this and I'm finally, this is it, I'm doing it. Was that it? I'm not sure what that means. Again, that Satan then entered into him. Something sort of came to fruit or fruition right then to a completion uh, that hadn't quite reached that far yet in Iscariot in that moment when Jesus uh, gave him, just identified him, said, yeah, I know who you are, Iscariot. Therefore, Jesus says to him, what you do, do quickly. Now, no one of those reclining at the table knew for what purpose he had said this to him. Uh, nobody really apparently picked up on what Jesus was saying, they could see that he had identified who would betray him, but this, this saying, what you do, do quickly, didn't seem to register with them. So uh, when Judas leaves, I don't know that they really understand that, oh, he's leaving to, uh, to go betray Jesus now. For some were supposing, because Judas had the money box, that Jesus was saying to him, buy the things we have need of for the feast. Because uh, they were in the midst of the feast, and they were probably going to do some more. And, and so maybe, the, maybe he needs to buy, buy some more uh, supplies or food or something for the feast. Pay for what they've already got. Yeah. Or else they supposed that he should give something to the poor. So uh, they're thinking... Maybe Jesus wants 
Judas to go get something for the feast, or maybe he's a, appointed him to maybe go help a needy family that doesn't have Passover, you know, so that's maybe what he's doing. That's what Jesus means by do what you do quickly. So after receiving the morsel, he went out immediately, and it was night. And I just think that's such a sort of a powerful way to conclude that sentence or that verse. So after receiving the, the morsel, he went out immediately, and it was night. It was like darkness fell at that moment. And uh, I just think that's a, a powerful way of stating the condition spiritually of what has just gone down at the Last Supper. Uh, Therefore, when he had gone out, Jesus says, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. Even though it's dark, darkness has fallen, you might say, but Jesus does not pronounce that over it. Instead, he says, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him immediately. What does it mean? What does glorified mean? Here. Darkness fell. Judas went out. What is being set in motion? Let's just be clear. What's being set in motion? It's rest. His arrest, his his trials, his crucifixion, all of that is being set in motion. And it's being set in motion right this instant. That's your immediately. How does God glorify Jesus in those things? Or how is God glorified in Jesus in those things? Always somebody wants to talk. That guy wanted to talk. What about you? (laughs) How is God glorified? Let's think about it. What is the most powerful thing you can think of when you think of your own life and you think about God and you think about how I am saved What's the most powerful thing? What do we talk about every Sunday morning? What do we gather around here for? What does that bread in this cup represent? All right, it represents his death. It represents his body and his blood. It represents his crucifixion. It represents what John cried out at the beginning of his ministry. He cried out and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's powerful and glorious and at last... Jesus, through these awful things, horrible things, has brought salvation so completely and so momentously that it is glorious beyond measure what he has done, what he has accomplished, even though it was darkness doing it to him. Still, the effect is That, hey, me, the darkest one, I am saved. I am enlightened. I am taken from headed for hell to headed for heaven. I'm taken from headed for eternal suffering to being able to be amongst the heavenly ones for the remainder of eternity. I glorify God in Jesus Christ and what he did Through Jesus that night? Absolutely yes. Okay, that's to me what glorified means. Uh, That God glorified Jesus by setting him on this path and Jesus enables it always by allowing it to come to pass. Uh, Little children, Jesus goes on, he says, little children, I'm with you. A little while longer, you will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. What does he mean? What's that? 
He's going, going away. He's going back to heaven. But I thought I could go to heaven. He has to go through hell first. Bingo. He has to go through hell first. There's places Jesus went I don't want to go. <laughs> but somehow he went through the darkness and the places where people were lost uh, to eternity. I don't completely understand that. But later on books in the New Testament do represent that something of this nature happened. I don't want to go there. And as a matter of fact, as I believe in him, he actually promises me I can't do it. I'm not going there. Of course, he's saying also that in, if you take it in a certainly, I've taken it a, certain, a different direction than many people would, I suppose, but uh, the, the direction other people take it, I would agree with also. That is, now while I'm in this flesh, I cannot go where Jesus went, as, in, as much as he also went to the Father. I can't go to the Father in that direct uh, way in which there isn't even faith between. Uh, I can't do that as long as I'm in this flesh, as long as I'm not, I haven't died or Jesus has not returned. Yeah, I can't do that. So Jesus is going into a, a, not only the, the uh, areas that I first talked about and that uh, Jim prompted so well, but he's going to the Father in a direct fashion that as long as we live by faith, we cannot do. So that's, that's he's, he's what I believe he means. In the clouds, and we can't do that. Well, uh, we, we can't do it of ourselves, but even Jesus' uh, being raised from the earth, we will follow him in this, apparently. Uh, that when he returns, we will rise to meet him. So, yeah, we, we, we're following that track of Jesus for sure. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. I, but he says you can't go with me now, but later on you will. Yeah. Well, yeah, he, and in this is the case, he just says where I'm going, you cannot come. But yeah. certainly the, there is a time factor in what we're discussing right now that it's not yet, but it will be. Uh, let's see. A new commandment, he goes on, he says, A new commandment I, have given you, I give to you that you love one another, even as I loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are disciples if you have love for one another. What is impressive about these two verses? Let's start with this one. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another even as I loved you, that you also love one another. I love you enough to wash your feet. There you go, okay. You should love one another, say. Okay. What kind of a, really kind of a momentous statement is Jesus making here? No Don't they have commandments already? Yes, what was that, Ruth? I was going to say probably no greater love than, than that what Jesus gave us. So okay, no greater love than what Jesus gave us, that's right. Uh, in the Old Testament, you had ten commandments. Of course, you had others as well, but you had ten commandments, and Jesus is essentially saying, this one wasn't in there, but you must have it. This is the new commandment. So Jesus is basically saying, you have come into a new arrangement between you and God, and actually you and me, but you've come into a new arrangement, and this is your commandment. Love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So this is, I believe, the, the key for us uh, in living our lives out. We, we need to let this question rest in our minds often, especially when we don't feel like it. We have to ask ourselves, do I look like a disciple? How will people know if I'm a disciple? Okay, how do I act like one? Yeah, I have love. That's it. If I love you, yeah, then I'm acting, I look like a disciple. If I don't, if instead I'm, you know, hateful towards you, do mean things to you, or 
uh, say, talk poorly of you, then I'm probably not looking much like a disciple at that point. Love is not just an emotion. Love is an action. In fact, I would suggest to you that in our Eastern speak, we were talking about this the other day, that love is an action primarily and perfectly without or with emotion. Why, why am I getting at that? Well, just remember, Jesus talked about uh, how, how it was that you, you had a situation where somebody hated another person, and yet it was a righteous thing because uh, he was choosing uh, Christ instead of him. And that action of choosing Christ instead of the other guy or the, the person that doesn't want you to go that direction towards Christ, that's actionly speaking, that's hateful towards him. It doesn't have anything to do with your emotion. That's just the way the physics of it or the, the physical arrangement of things work out. I don't hate my friend Tim that I used to sit around and drink beer with back in high school. And then one day I got to the point with him where I decided that wasn't what I was going to do. I wasn't going that direction. I wasn't going to do that anymore. And so I sat down with him one day uh, in a pizza place and uh, I ordered a Pepsi and uh, the waitress brought me my Pepsi and I started drinking it and Tim just, oh, Geyser, you ain't going to do that. Get that man a beer. Well, I said, no, I'm not going to do it. And such a rift developed between the two of us that you could see it as hate, I suppose. It wasn't really, emotionally, there's no hatred there at all. But I divided myself from him because I'm not going to live that way. I'm not going to do that anymore. It's not going to be me going forward. So uh, I, I want you to start to get a hold of love and hate in this action sense uh, that Al is talking about, that it's, it's how you behave towards others more than it really is what you feel. We, we've turned it all into feelings, but the Bible has it as action. If you love one another means if you do for one another. And that fits in to, I think it was Ruth brought up this again not too many sentences ago, uh, at least on your part. <laughs> Mine is many, but uh, she brought up the fact that Jesus had washed feet. Well, that was that loving action. And that's what we've got to capture. We've got to get on to that. Uh, Simon Peter says to him, Lord, where are you going? So, Simon, <laughs> I love Simon, but sometimes he just is a head scratcher, I've got to tell you. He says, uh, Jesus just gets through. He does his thing. He says, Look, at, I'm giving you a brand new commandment. You've got to love one another. That's what it is. Uh, and this is the way everybody's going to know you're my disciple. If you love one another, where are you going? <laughs> Peter, did you not hear anything I just said? You know, uh, Simon Peter says to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I go, you cannot follow me now. There you are, Al. But you will follow later. Peter says to him, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. Did Peter even hear the part about love? Well, maybe. He says he's going to lay down his life for him. What's the, what is driving the question Peter asks? What's Peter trying to avoid? Ha! Who said that? Separation. That's what Peter is trying to avoid. Separation. Uh, he's saying, no, nah, you're not going anywhere. You're staying right here with me. Jesus answered, or answers, electric asterisk there, will you lay down your life for me? In other words, well, Peter, you just said you'll lay your life down. He's, now he's questioning it. He says, will you lay your life, down your life for me? In other words, it's kind of like, oh, really? Would you really? Will you lay your life down for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, a rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. 
Did you notice Jesus returned to the matter of love? Where is love in his reply? Can you see it? It's lay down your life for my friend. That's where it is. He says, that, that will you lay down your life for me? He, he brings up love again, really. Uh, and, uh, and then he says, why did, I want to ask this question. Why did he tell Peter this about the future? Why do you suppose he told Peter this? Why didn't you just let it happen? So what? Someday we'll be together again. Well, someday we'll be together again. Yeah. You're not as strong as you think you are. Okay, you're not as strong as you think you are. Jesus wants Peter to know that he knows Peter's heart and what Peter is going to do. And I think when we understand this about Jesus, that he actually knows that we're, we're trying to be good for it, but we're not always good for it. <laughs> he knows us. He knows that we're, we're trying to be capable and consistent with him, but we don't always get there. And something about Peter knowing this, and Jesus, as, as it goes on, the beautiful chapter of John, most beautiful one to me is the, the, the last one, I love his interview with Peter in which Peter is so broken over his inability to, uh, to stay with Christ uh, that, that Jesus has to come and kind of, I think, administer a kind of a, a, a counseling or a psychological therapy to, to Peter. And it's wonderful to look at there in the last chapter of, uh, of John. Uh, so uh, that, I think, is all supposed to be part of our understanding of ourselves, that we get it, that, that we're Peter in the picture, so to speak, that we have those same things happen with us, and we have to take ourselves in relation to Jesus as, as Jesus took Peter in relation to himself uh, and understand ourselves that way. Okay. John 14, we're going to get into John 14. Yes, I was hoping we would. John 14, Jesus continues speaking now. Uh, he's still apparently in this room, the upper room, and he says, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. What do you take from this verse? Didn't think maybe I was going to stop right there, did you? Ha. I'm stopping almost every verse in this one. This is such a dense chapter. There's so much stuff in it. Just want to get it all. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. What do you see in there? How is it that those disciples, they'd seen all this stuff go down. They'd seen how even Peter was not going to really measure up somehow. And now he says, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. How's that supposed to help? Uh, well, I'm just going to tell you. I'll give you some things. That, give it to God. Okay, you've got to give it to God, yes. There are things that happen to all of us that are overwhelming we, we're, we, and I don't know what all that you've struggled with in your life. Uh, the overwhelming loss of a, a loved one, that can happen. Uh, the overwhelming uh, loss because you find yourself once again unable to perform or uh, not to perform according to God's will. And, and, and so you just, you're so sunk that you just don't know what to say or think about it. To me, this... Yeah, go ahead, Al. You just can't do what you want to do. Yeah, well, and in, in that moment, if I hear in my ear, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. I'm God. <laughs> yeah, I'm reminded that God loves me in all of this. And that he will see me through to a wonderful end somehow. A way that I don't see yet, but he will see me through. 
Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Jesus sees the future, and if he were to relate to them exactly what the future is, you know, tonight in a little while, uh, Judas is going to walk up. He's going to kiss me on the cheek. I'm going to be arrested and taken away and tried uh, three different times and uh, never really found guilty, but they will crucify me in the most hideous fashion. And every one of you will, will run away from me. I don't think they could have taken that. They, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't want to know that. But they're going to need these words as those things come to pass. He's trying to reassure, reassure them. Yeah, he's doing what he can. Jesus sees it ahead. He sees it. But uh, he wants to make sure they understand. Look, out, out beyond even that, those things that you're going through, you won't, you won't be able to realize how hard and difficult it is even now if he were to tell them. And it's just horrible for the disciples, I think, in those days ahead. Uh, even after Jesus is raised from the dead, there's still a good deal of horror, I think, to deal with and difficulty. But these words, hopefully, will ring in their minds and in their hearts because there is coming way wonderful things, you know, that, that Jesus will be actually raised from the dead, that uh, he will... Uh, go on up into heaven, ascend before their very eyes. And that they, they will be the ones standing in the courts of Jerusalem announcing the great good news. And many of those who have been Jesus' enemies will come on that day and give themselves to Christ in, in uh, surrender and into baptism and then into, into church life beyond. So great good things are coming. And the promise, of course of not just uh, those things, but of eternity uh, comes out of all of this stuff that's going to go down in the next uh, several hours, really, you could say, uh, days. And uh, so, so they'll need these words then, as you and I need them, in times in our life when it just seems like we're not going to get out, that we don't, there's not a way to, to resolve this. But there is. God's got it. In my Father's house, Jesus says, are many dwelling places. If, I, if it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. It's kind of like, when I look at stuff like this, I just think, you can't make words like this up. <laughs> they are so beautiful and so golden and so powerful. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. Look at guys, there's where, where I'm going and where you're going there's lots and lots of places. Lots Enough of for you. And, and guys, if, if it wasn't like that, you know me well enough by now, I'll let you know. I'll let you know. And isn't that a wonderful promise that we know now where we're going and what we can do and what God's promised for us? Yeah, so that's absolutely. Good to know that that's mm -hmm. true. Yeah. I always, uh, it's kind of silly of me, but you know, I, I'm, I'm just kind of silly. There's a thing that comes to mind a lot when I look at a person in a casket, and <laughs> I think one of two things. <laughs> Either all dressed up and some place to go, or all dressed up and no place to go. <laughs> you know? Uh, but as Christians, we got some place to be, you know? We're already seated with him in the heavenly, says the Apostle Paul. It's done. It's, it's over in the sense that it is finished. It's completed. The work is finished. All we have to do is take possession. And uh, that comes when we die or when Christ returns. Do you feel that you can trust Jesus to tell you the truth? Do you? Do you feel like you can trust him to tell you the truth? And I ask you a little bit further. Do you, do you think that you can trust Jesus to tell you the truth even through the Bible? In other words, when you see his words in the Bible, do you believe that's the truth? And I wonder why you believe it's the truth. I do. I believe it's the truth. The things that Jesus say all have the ring of truth to them. 
They all just sound right. There's something in us that tells us so. Verse 3, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. Why would Jesus' disciples know the way where Jesus was going? And does this differ from where Jesus was going? Look how he says this. He says, uh, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Where I am, there you may be also. And you know the, he doesn't say you know where I'm going. He says you know the way where I am going. Why would Jesus' disciples know the way where Jesus was going? How would they know this? Uh Uh-huh, and that's coming in just a little bit, isn't it? And does this differ from where Jesus is going? Perhaps the way we think about it, it does. Ultimately, I don't think it does, but uh, there's a a slight difference there. Uh, the, the, The where he is going as opposed to the way he is going there. When you and I follow Jesus, we merely follow Jesus, then he is the way where he is going. We just follow him. We just do like he would do. Thomas says to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? See, I think Thomas actually delineates these two things here. That's what he says. He says, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way. Jesus says to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Does Jesus deal with where or with, or with the way here? Is this a where answer or a way answer? It's a way answer, isn't it? Jesus is saying, I'm the way and the truth and the life. Y'all want those things? That's me. He does do, deal with the where slightly now because he says no one comes to the Father but through me. He starts saying, this, this is how you get there. It's me. And the end point is who? No one comes to the Father. But through me. So we're headed for God. If you had known me, you would also have known my father. You would have known my father also. From now on, you'd know him and have seen him. Just wondering, have the way and the where converged? Yeah, I think they did in this sentence. If you have known me, you would have known my father also. He's the way and the father is the where. (laughs) So... They've started to come together. If you had known me, uh, you would have known the Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip says to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Now, Philip still is probably feeling like some of us do sometimes. I don't quite understand this. Jesus says to him, Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Is not this the very reason that Jesus came? What am I asking? I'm asking, he who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Jesus is has come for the very purpose of making clear what God's heart is. That's it. That's why Jesus showed up. And that's what Philip is not yet getting quite. Uh, Jesus goes on, he says, Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? It may be simple to believe that the Father is in Jesus. That is, we 
We can see Jesus uh, speaking truth. We can see Jesus able to heal. We can see his power. Uh, so we see the Father in Jesus. What does it mean that Jesus is in the Father? Okay. I'm going to leave that question up there with you. Uh, we're at 7, a little past 7.02 it looks like. So we're going to stop right there. And uh, we'll pick it up next week.